you can have a very wealthy life, but all those things can disappear. But what you learn always will guide you. Naomi was the first survivor that I spoke with. She sort of threw down the gauntlet for me, that it was sort of my civic duty as an artist to do something. There is no past without a future. There is no future without a past. So we can never forget about our past. Had 94% of the population said no, how would it have been different? And that climate of indifference, we live it every day. That didn't, that didn't die 70 years ago. That lives today. Dance can be very powerful, but it also, it can also be very frail. And so it, it, it's not always an effective way to tell a very profound story, or so I thought. I remember how fear entered your life. I have never been afraid of anything, but suddenly fear, there was what is going to happen to you? What will the next day bring? Will you be able to stay in your home? Will you have to leave? Will they take you away? Will they put you in a prison? Will they put you, 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 you didn't know. If I was going to talk about someone else's story, I was going to have to know as much as I could possibly know. And so I spent time at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. I spent time with survivors in preparation to spend three weeks in Eastern Europe, where I spent uh, time in eight different camps, concentration camps and death camps uh, across three different countries. Eventually, I came back and was filled with the knowledge that this was a bigger topic than I had imagined. And through Naomi's guidance, um, I was able to put it into perspective. You know, I was able to decide that it was not the story of the Holocaust. It was a story of one survivor of the Holocaust. I was the youngest of the family, and um, I felt like a princess. I felt that everything I want, I get. Uh, I attended a very prestigious school, which I finished. Um, I remember those years so vividly, but unfortunately, they did not continue. <laughs> Life's changed, and my life changed as soon as Hitler came to power. It was really incredible to see the people that would come to Poland and to cross the border and escape Germany. And then in 1939, on the 1st of September, where that was my birthday, my 19th birthday, the war broke out. What a wonderful present I got. A Second World War. And finally, when the Germans came into the city, then, of course, you knew that immediately they started persecuting Jews. I, I, I can't say that I'm empathetic towards a Holocaust survivor because I couldn't possibly have that sort of understanding of the emotional implications of that event. But I certainly can sympathize with being singled out. As a young person growing up in a small town in Kentucky called Morganfield, I remember that it was so small that everyone knew each other, so there was this familial uh, atmosphere, um, which was the positive aspect of being there. It was a community that was not particularly tolerant in the way the ways in which they treated outside people, I guess. People that were not 
like themselves. When I found dance, I connected to my body in a way that I never expected. Out, two, more toe, Brittany, that's it. And arm second. Um, I, found, uh, I found strength, I found my empowerment through using my body in this way. And um, it sort of liberated me out of that past um, feeling of inadequacy, I guess. Every day that I went to high school was torture. Every single day. Verbal abuse was constant, but it was almost the fear of physical abuse that was more challenging. And I think that's what terrorism is. You know, it's causing this fear um, that experience um, sort of informs all, the, all that I do as an artist. It was an experience that has taught me a lot. I am sure it was an experience that has made me a much stronger person because otherwise I don't know, as I said, I was a spoiled child and I was not exposed to any tragedy. And here I am exposed to brutality, I am exposed to pain, I am exposed to prejudice, I am exposed to hate, I am exposed to everything that is so negative in life. And then I just go on. I had the honor of performing the role of the survivor after Naomi Warren's story, the first time that we did it. And now I come to it on the other side of the footlights, so to speak, uh, as the rehearsal director. And so my responsibility now is to get the dancers and the cast ready for them to perform it. The quality of the dance Good. is reflected by the community that you build around it. All right, see you in 15. Um, uh -huh. um, so you're going to learn Adam and Eve? Okay. You're going to learn Adam. I was like, sweet. Okay. Okay, so yeah. come to that rehearsal this afternoon instead of the family rehearsal. Okay. All right. Uh, Paul? Paul? Yes. So, I'm making a little switch in Adam and Eve. Okay. So he, he, he's gonna be your new Adam. Casting a dance is always very delicate. I mean, particularly if you're doing something like, like the Holocaust and Humanity Project. I knew that this character, this young character of Naomi would be pivotal. And having a person who had enough life experience and willingness to look at this, these events, not shy away from them, go right into them, and take them as their own would be right. difficult. Does that make sense? Now plie down on two feet. Right. Let's go one more time. Each of these performers will bring something. No one escapes. No one escapes hardship in their life. I think it's going to be interesting to watch how ERA connects her personal life of being a mother back to that historical event and how it will manifest in her performance. Maybe we can go to Quacks in a minute and we can go get some bread for dinner. You want to do that? Oh, you want a cookie? Of course you do. Let's get ready for dinner. Be careful. Let's go check dinner. All right. 
six weeks of doing a ballet about the Holocaust can really bring you down, and I'm worried about how to how to not bring it home with me as much as I did last time. I can't be that depressed <laughs> when I come home. I have to be happy and with my kids, so it's going to be a very exhausting five weeks ahead of me. <laughs> They've told us to get out of the train, separated the men from the women immediately. They created two lines and my mother and I were holding on to each other. And then my mother, in her wisdom, realized that the shorter line is much better to be in. So she pushed me. And, um, and I just was totally confused. And I joined the shorter line. And my mother was put on the truck. And my mother looked at me, and I looked at her, and the truck left. And that's the way I said goodbye to my mother. The way Chris will manifest in this dance is difficult to say. I mean, He's young, he's got a lot of learning uh, to do on this subject matter, which everyone is doing. Everybody has a different life experience, um, and I'm not sure of all the intricacies of his. So it will be interesting as we're going through this process. It becomes a very emotional process. Everybody brings something different into the studio that you don't expect. Seven. One. Good, don't let your arm get behind you there. That's one. Growing up in Arkansas, you know, ballet obviously was not the uh, everyday run of the mill. So I started dancing at the age of eight, um, and I really took off with it. It was a really great time, an hour and a half, you know, almost every day to just focus on yourself, you know, physically improving, and then as you got older, you know, artistically improving. Okay, two, three, four, five, okay. <laughs> the hardest part is, besides the physical, doing the, the steps and then also building the stamina to make it easier, is also to keep yourself focused within what the piece is about and, and not becoming casual with it as it becomes easier. We're gonna be running it every day and it needs to stay as interesting as the first time you learned it. <laughs> let's uh, let's start from the beginning. We'll start without music, and then we will go and uh, and start to piece it together if we could, please. I am um, a person that wears many hats, but predominantly the one that I enjoy wearing the most is that of choreographer and mentor, and so I spend a lot of time in the studio with the dancers because that's where I'm most comfortable. Like your Tiger Woods. There you go. Mostly, yeah. Not mostly Tiger Woods, not really Tiger Woods. That's right. Just don't lead with the knee as you're coming through. Make sure you're leading from side to side. That's it. Good. Good. I think that ballet, dance, contemporary dance um, becomes a very interesting platform because a lot of what can get in the way in some of these very difficult conversations. A lot of the things that can cause us to trip over each other happens in and around words. Stephen realized that he did have this platform and he had the courage and the conviction um, to have that conversation. And we strategically identify 
who is most interested in the work we're about to put on the stage? Who has the greatest interest in this particular conversation around human rights? And then we set out a plan together and, and identify how each of us will get out into the community. In terms of the role of an executive director within this company, there are so many aspects of it. For instance, um, there's an entire mechanism around raising the funds, the development process, all that goes into raising the funds to ensure that this project happens. The future possibilities for light seem absolutely limitless at this point. We will be going to Miami in the fall. We will be going to Israel in the fall of 2013. We're in a really powerful conversation with Denver and conversations with about 10 other cities. It's a rather uh, involved process. Can you guys come here just to come, come together a little bit more? Understand that it's, it may be a difficult process as you're going through it. Just to remember that this is theater. This isn't life, okay? And that art allows you to be in a place to see something without judgment, and then hopefully go out and do something, right? Okay, let's go to work. We've sold 334 tickets to date. Um, we have to go 1,000 122. We're under the gun, this is kind of go time for us. Um, it's not necessarily about targeting the people that have been to our ballets before. It's about creating new audiences, and that's it's going to be tricky business. So. The people know are going to be an, an emotional investment, and that's why they go into it to to have that emotional investment, and they, they know that it's going to be something that's going to reach into their hearts and um, and affect them in some way. And, and this is how light is. It takes me a while to process information. I need to see it, I need to feel it, I need to do it, and then I need to think about it for a period of time. And right now, I feel, especially today, I feel very overwhelmed by how much work we have to do in such a short amount of time. Because knowing that we have two weeks left in the studio, I want to know all of my material and have made all of the artistic choices that I want to make within the next week. Yeah. Because really once we, it's going to be slow going for the first That's what I said, but it's yeah. Like... yeah. <laughs> um, come up just a second. This and... is so much easier the first time. <laughs> uh, Paul. Mm -hmm. We already did you. Hmm. Your right hand. Did I tell you the wrong thing? You told me this. Uh, I'm nervous. Your right hand should be very good. Uh, quite a long hold. There. Still learning some of the other sections and haven't touched on them yet, so I'm interested to see how fast that's going to come together. Because I think open. Some of them. Um, okay, Eric, you are leaning back. This I had to remind myself that I was pregnant because I just naturally, my body just wanted to do it. And I feel like if I wasn't pregnant, maybe my body could have done it. I'm sure I would have been sore the next day, but I may have been able to slip right back into it. I see Era do it and I'm moving through her. I trained as a classical ballet dancer. And as odd as it may sound, but point shoes and pink tights and tutus are kind of what I have been trained in for the past 20 years. <laughs> and now, it's, it's, you're stripping that away from me, and I'm left with just my body. I'm barefoot. I'm still dancing, but 
that is very difficult for me because I can't rely on my ballet technique or my point shoes or anything that I'm used to defining myself as as a ballet dancer. It's a lot of pressure. We don't just go into a studio and learn steps. As we're going through the process, they go through my entire trip, my entire journey of learning. This is why I chose this gesture here, because I experienced this. And one arm goes up as place? if you're shielding yourself. As if there's a, a grate, like you're in, inside like a street underground, and there's a grate with a light coming up. I mean, on the schedule, we're calling it boxcars, but really we call it sirens because it's been called lots of different things. In, in this dance, lots of things have, have uh, changed as I learn more about the dance and as, as, as sort of the dance reveals itself to me. Um, this is probably the most intimate part of the, of the dance for me. Go, and one, and two, and three. The trip four, was absolutely five. indescribable. It was, you couldn't, there was no room to sit down. You had to stand up. There was no food, there was no water, there were no sanitary facilities. And so, uh, you know, and it lasted for me, it seemed that it lasted a lifetime. Eventually we came to a stop. It was in the middle of the winter and the, door were, the doors of the car were open and there came this fresh air and you tried to inhale the fresh air, but then you looked out and you saw that was Auschwitz Birkenau. And so then you thought, well, that is the terrible, terrible place. There is a, a sculpture in uh, Loge uh, that the Russians uh, made after they liberated the camp there of these prisoners standing with their heads bowed, and it's very rigid sculpture. It reminded me of stories of prisoners being in the cattle cars being transported in winter time, and and freezing, and just that with the the, the clenched fists, just shivering, without shoes in the in the ice and the snow. But the steps aren't that difficult. I mean, they are difficult, but it's really the, the storytelling which is difficult. Combining those two together is very, it's very hard. And she rolls her stomach. Ready? Four, five, six, go one. The physicality of it's not extremely challenging. Step-wise, I don't think that the parts that I'm doing I think that the, the challenge right now for me is just, again, uh, learning how to work within the musical idea of what he wanted. Stephen is, from what I've seen, attracted to very interesting music, these sort of contemporary composers. And so I think that when it's being either created, or in this case, staged, um, the difficult part uh, is trying to find the counts. You could even go more <laughs> and I purposely chose minimalist composers as a way to not situate the, the work in the 1940s, that the Holocaust lives today, that we are always to be mindful that that which happened then can happen now. So I didn't want to place it contextually in the 40s. I wanted to keep it contemporary. Give it a little bit and then run. Let's see. Yeah. Yes, please. Five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five. That's it. Bring it in, Becky. That's it. That's right. All right. It was very good today. Thank you. Thank you. Coming along. Take five. Could only lean on her arm. She's going to help five. She might be able to try. We have 
officially learned all of the steps, if you will, but where you know musicality isn't quite there on a couple sections, and uh, we're putting together, you know, piece by piece, starting to combine sections. So we're, we'll have runs by the end of the week. We'll start running the whole piece. So how does it feel coming back to this piece after how many years has it been? About five? More than that. I think it's been. I think we did it in two thousand five. There's definitely an education, I think, that I have now that I didn't then. I, I was very aware of the Holocaust, and uh-huh. but only what I had learned in school, which unfortunately is not as much as it should be. Um, you know, having firsthand testimonies with survivors and reading, you know, different novels and, of course, looking at documentaries. Do you feel that it's been a very important part of, of this piece as, it's, as you're working on it to engage in that dialogue? Because... That's my favorite part of this whole process of this ballet is that is that it is starting a community dialogue that is ongoing. That when the ballet ends and the and the you know the curtain closes, that just like you said, that's not the end. That's not like oh that was a great ballet and then people move on. That's I hope that's not what happens. I hope that it it causes people to start looking into you know just genocide that's happening still. Good morning. Let's start. Um, so today is the first run of the entire ballet, remain in the moment, right? It's 80 minutes long in order to keep the drama progressing forward, try to stay right on in it, okay? Slowly. Slowly, guys. Now I am trying to experience it as it happens to the character. So I start the rehearsal and I'm not thinking about the end of the ballet. And that's scary because something new might happen, but then it also, it's more raw and more real when you let it happen to you. So it's a little uncomfortable, but I think I'm at that point. I think that dancers live in a, 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 try to live within a protected environment, meaning that you're, you're asked to share a lot of your own yourself personally. And then light, this dance um, heightens that. This is going to be a process that's going to pull out a lot. I know what's coming, but I'm I'm still interested to see what it's going to be like once you're actually in there and what emotions are going to sort of bubble to the top. It's been hard, but I love the ballet. And I'm actually very sad that I only have four more opportunities to do it. And in order to survive all this hell and all the terrible tragedy of what we were facing, we just bound together. But I really think that it is just, it was so important not to be alone and have friendships in camp. The greatest thing about this ballet also is that it really brings, since it is such an ensemble work, it really brings the whole company together and unifies us. And we learn a lot together, We, we grow a lot through this process. I hope that now he trusts me more, with not necessarily modern roles, but more emotional roles, more roles that you can have 
more dramatic abilities. Um, I really enjoy that now that I'm older. I like more dramatic roles. And so we'll see. I am from off stage living it with the dancers as they're performing it. I am not apart from it. I am with it. Let's take 10 minutes and then we'll come back and, and talk. Very, very, very good today. No, I mean, yes. <laughs> I'm going to let you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> Escaped just yesterday, but another two this morning. Uh, French it went well. Are still Did you see the placement this morning? Yes. What a great placement. Yes. I'm glad they ran that picture, too. Now to a city under siege in Syria. Syrian rebels are retreating from their stronghold of Homs today. They claim okay, the move is a tactical one. They wanted to protect the people there from more oh, death sorry, and I'm destruction at the hands of the Syrian city. military, which has been bombarding homes for weeks. I would like to say good morning to Stephen Mills, the choreographer, director of Valley Austin. He's got a new show coming up this weekend, and it's very exciting. So tell us all about it, Stephen. The dance itself um, tells the story of um, a Holocaust survivor named uh, Naomi Warren. You think it's over, or think it's past history, and then you hear about the news broadcast yesterday with the mad motorcycle murderer going right. around shooting Jewish people in, right. in France. I just... Right. You can turn on the news right now, and there, there are, are massive killings going on in Syria. You know, these genocides continue. Right. It's a lesson we've not learned. So what brings the ballet company that you direct into interpreting this story. Feel the top of that ankle. While dance seems like a most unlikely form to tell this story, it's turned out to be actually pretty perfect. Other side, and Michael, give just a little more ankle to the side. There you go. And then I just get to the theater right when it opens, and I take time. I lay out all my makeup and have everything ready. Take class in the morning. I mean, or take class on stage, and then get ready. And then it starts. It's kind of a whirlwind once you get to the theater, so I try to make sure my day is as calm as possible so that once I get there, I know it's just going to kind of take off and then all of a sudden it'll be over. <laughs> superstitious. Um, everything that I did I would have to do again. So the first showing to the public, whatever I touched or whoever I talked to or wherever I went to or where I got water from or anything like that, it had to be a repeat. But as I've gotten older, I guess I've sort of just, I don't want to say given up, but it's like it's gonna, whatever's ha gonna happen is gonna happen. So for me, I guess the ritual is just sort of to stay as calm and as normal as possible. Opening night is a magical experience for any opening night, this one being so very special to us. Have you seen Cookie? We arrive about 90 minutes early. Uh, we come in through the back of the house and stow our belongings. 
percent. We sign in so we know which members of our team are all over this very large building. There is a choreography that happens for those of us that work front of house as well as those uh, that are on stage. I see Naomi as um, a naturally gregarious person. But very often, you'll find Naomi deep in contemplation. I am certain that um, there are things within her experience that even almost 70 years later come forward to her. And I, I think that we'll never know. I'm not sure her family knows all that she, all that she experienced. And I think that's as it should be. Thank you These are from much. everyone. We wanted to thank you so much for everything you've shared with us over the past uh, seven, seven years. years. <laughs> so, thank you. So, here well, you we are, are inspiration, and we love you very much. Thank yeah. you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, I, I wish I was a little younger, <laughs> <laughs> but I never could dance very well. <laughs> I don't know whether you read the paper, but it made me th two years older than I really am. I am only 91 years old. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and we're playing. We've had a few minutes, and we don't have to. They, uh, they were to really know. excited to be able to bring these flowers to you. So. Some gum or something? Would you mind? Do you know if. Uh, I would say that I'm generally not very um, um, a, a nervous person at an opening. Light uh, becomes something different because it's so emotionally charged. Um, I am, I am, and the dancers are telling someone's story um, that is uh, extremely personal to them, and particularly when they are sitting in the audience watching it, it becomes a very uh, charged uh, hour and a half. Now that I've been doing it, I have a sense of accomplishment that I am actually doing it. It is the most human, this is the most real, and emotionally exhausting ballets that I've ever done. You have to be willing to go and be very vulnerable and open up all your heart and all of your emotions on stage. And that I haven't been asked to do before. The ballet is segmented, and because within the story of any survivor, it starts with a life before, and a family, and a culture, and traditions that were eventually, uh, where these people were eventually targeted, ostracized where they were further uh, dehumanized, where they either died or they survived. And so as I was doing the, the research process, I was trying to keep all of these things forward in my mind. Era was rehearsing the scene where uh, she has to strip. She has to take her dress off. She's being uh, asked in a very violent way from this anonymous figure uh, from the audience um, to undress and get in that box, right? Well, how do we do that? If you're not showing the perpetrator, how do you do that? The dancer has to reflect that person through their eyes and through their, through their facial expression back to the audience. How does that happen? 
It has to be a real moment. It can't be a false moment. And I've never done this before, ever, in my career as a director, as a choreographer. But we weren't getting that moment at all. And so there, there's this, she's, she's standing and she's looking upstage at all, everything that's gone. You know, everyone else has left and gone to this place. And she's standing there looking. And the moment when she has to turn, I came up behind her. And she turned, and I was in her face. And I started to yell. But she didn't stop dancing. She continued to do it. But it added an urgency to her work. And that scene became something completely different. I think people are very affected by music, and there are certain sounds that we resonate with as well, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. And this siren um, that is embedded in the, the third movement of the ballet is very intense um, because it's very loud, and to us, a siren connotes emergency. To a survivor, it would have meant, you know, get out of your houses, come down to the street. You know, we are, we are taking you against your will somewhere. It's about putting people in these spaces. You know, there's stories of families being shoved in and when there wasn't any more space, throwing the babies on top, you know, throwing the children, in, just to get as many bodies in as is possible. All of that is inscribed in this ballet. I guess I have to appreciate the fact that I have a job that, especially with this project, has allowed me to put emotions into my workplace instead of the workplace being sort of um, stone-faced and, and very, you know, stay strong and don't make any issues. But through this project, we've been allowed to sort of ride this emotional wave of, of up and down that has almost helped me in my personal life to not need to do that. To, to do a project like this that's so open to so many different interpretations of what it can even be about um, tolerance and, and life and death and, and love and hate and so it sort of helped me to understand a bigger picture which makes your personal drama seem very minuscule. Go, take media six. Go. Oh. Go. Most people understand the Holocaust through the photographs and the film. And in those pictures uh, are very strong narratives. The facial expressions, the way the bodies are, 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 are represented is very graphic and very sad and tell a, a microcosm of a story. And so because dancers use their bodies in much the same way, it's as though their dance and, and the human body was meant to tell this story.
But I'd always thought about inserting some vocalization within it. And then working through this process of restaging the ballet, I felt the need physically as an audience member to hear it. I felt the need to allow the dancers to take all this knowledge that they had built up and have a release from them out into the audience. And the first time we heard it, it was very violent, the scream that was coming from the dancers. Since I retired, I haven't really had a moment where I felt a yearning to be back in it until we did this ballet again. And I kind of knew that that was going to happen. They brought me right back in it. And I yearn for that. It's a little bit bittersweet because this ballet meant so much to me and still does. So I think I've been most surprised, not by can I do the steps or, or am I going to get this lift or am I going to, you know, those things just tend to come with rehearsal anyway. But I've just been most surprised just sitting on the side and just observing and then finding myself reacting, getting that pit and your feeling in your stomach and, and being like, oh, wh where did that come from? Personally, I tend to be a very guarded person emotionally. Um, I experienced loss at a very early age. My father passed away when I was six. So that definitely, maybe the way my brain works as well, I'm more of an analytical person and I can detach myself emotionally. And now you kind of think of those moments and I just think of how my mom felt when my father passed away, but yet she kept going on. I mean, it's not, it's not the Holocaust by any means, but it's still her personal pain and loss. And now being a mother and a wife, I can't imagine losing my husband. I mean, I have to imagine it in the ballet and that is what's really hard. And just thinking of my children not knowing their father that takes me to the place I need to be. And you, when you are not, when you are not satisfied with what you have, and not knowing at, as of what is going to happen tomorrow, it is just so so hard to continue. But still, there's maybe a little hope left.
when I was making this dance, Ashes was the last section of the ballet. It's, it's difficult to say that after an event such as the Shoah, there's any beauty in life. Once, once you've opened Pandora's box and you look inside and you know the inhumanity that man is capable of inflicting, it's difficult to get back, in my mind, to positivity. Um, it was Naomi's insistence that the ballet end with hope. And on the 15th of April, 1945, the British armies uh, liberated Bergen-Belsen. And that was the first feeling of freedom, of being free. And this, to describe the, the inside of you, to describe your heart, to describe your mind, that now you are free and you have really survived. It's a miracle. We go through this great devastation, but on, on the end of that, we're back on the other side of regeneration and rebuilding. And that really is what life is about. You realize that there's a new life that you are going to face now. And what do you do with this new life? And I decided that my old life is behind me. You build on your past, but you look forward to your future. It doesn't become an abstract, it is personal. And, and, and even though it is a show, you know, per se, it becomes a very personal sharing and communication from the dancer to the audience and back. And that's why um, I will be doing this work for the rest of my life. That connection back to that young boy who was bullied mercilessly in school. This is the way I pay it back. Funding for Arts and Context is provided by Wells Fargo Bank, where you'll find a wide range of tools and resources to help you take control of your finances, and bankers to help you find one that fits your needs. Wells Fargo, together we'll go far. And also in part by the City of Austin through the Cultural Arts Division, believing an investment in the arts is an investment in Austin's future. Visit Austin at nowplayingaustin.com. And from Texas Performing Arts, celebrating 30 years of arts programming education, and inspiration. Details and tickets at texasperformingarts.org. And by the Kadoski Foundation.